This time starts the morning services, and if you're using a songbook, we'll sing the first verse of Psalm 440. Psalm 440. <clears throat> My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, for thee all the folly of sin I resign my Christmas redeemer, my Savior, art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. <clears throat> Psalm for Lord's Supper, Psalm 452. Psalm 452. <clears throat> Night with heaven pinion, rooted o'er the veil. All around was silent, save the night winds well, when Christ the man of sorrows in fears and sweat and blood are straight in the garden. Praise his voice to God, smitten for offenses which were not his own. He for our transgressions had to be alone. No friend with words to comfort, nor hand to help was there. Then the meek and holy humbly bowed in prayer. Have a father, father, if indeed it may, let this cup of anguish pass from Have a father, father, let thy will be This morning I'll be reading from uh, John, the 12th chapter, verses 27 through 36. 27 through 36. Jesus predicts his death on the cross. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Therefore the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sakes. Now this is the judgment of this world. 
Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Then he said, signify by what death he will die. The people answered him who had heard from the law that Christ remains forever. And how can you say the Son of God, the Son of Man, must be lifted up, who is Son of Man? Then Jesus answered and said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning as we assemble here today to remember Jesus Christ and His precious body, Father, His nails were drove in His hand and His feet and a crown of thorn upon His brow. He suffered, Father, that we can have everlasting life. May we realize, Father, the pain and anguish He had going to the cross and on the cross, Father. And He did it because He loved us and He loved you, Father. And help us to think and meditate upon these things at this hour. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Pray with me again. Father, at this hour, as we think about Jesus Christ's precious blood, 
And this cup is the emblem of that Father that He let Himself be hanged upon a cross. And every word, Father, that His skin was pierced, blood came forth. And we know, Father, that we have to have blood for life. And He gave that blood, Father. He gave that life that we can have everlasting life. And we know, Father, that that blood was so powerful that it covered the sins of mankind from the beginning of time to the end of time. May we realize, Father, how important, how necessary that Jesus had to do that. And let's be very thankful, Father, that He did do that. May we take this in a like manner as we did the bread in a pleasing manner. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Before we have the contribution, we'll sing the third verse of 440. In mansions of glory and in the light, I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with a glittering crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus is now. This time we're going to take an offering uh, separate from the Lord's table and we pray that we'll think about it before we give and give with a loving, cheerful heart. We pray with me? Father, we thank you for everything you give us, Father. Uh, we're so richly blessed in this country. We don't know what it is to be hungry. We don't know what it is not to have shelter. But we know, Father, many in the world do not have these things. And uh, every day, Father, they suffer from health and lack of food and shelter. Father, we want to give this morning because we love you. 
and we want to give it in a loving, cheerful manner. And we pray, Father, it will be used to bring honor and glory and to save souls. We love you, Father. We love your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray this prayer in our Son's name. Be thy will. Amen. I serve the risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He is. He is within my heart. In all the world around me, I see His loving care. I know my heart grows weary. I never will despair. I know that He is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of his appearing will come at last. He says, he says, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He says, he says, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He says within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujah to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. The song before our prayer and our scripture reading is on 544. It's on 544. <clears throat> Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me does continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I defy, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps 
and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. We bow with me. Dear Father in heaven, we are so glad to be coming to you at this time, on this first day of the week. Lord, this time we have to remember your great power and to remember the greatest time and the greatest power of all. Lord, that time when you rose your son from the grave. Lord, that time when you defeated death, when you took down your enemies and you made it possible for us to join with you in heaven. Lord, please help us to keep that on the forefront of our minds throughout this week, throughout the rest of this day. Lord, we can't wait to be with you in heaven, and we're so glad that you made that path for us. But Lord, while we're still here, we still struggle. We still have problems, Lord, and we bring those to you. Lord, there are those here among us who have loved ones who are in the hospital or have passed on. Lord, please be with them. Comfort them. Comfort us as our hearts break with them. Lord, there are so many people on our hearts who are struggling, who are struggling both physically, emotionally, and even spiritually, Lord. Please be with them in the ways that you know how. Comfort them, comfort us, and strengthen us to lead them in a way that's true to you. Lord, please be with us as we continue in this service. Help us always, Lord, to be focused on you, to raise up praise to you, to honor you, to have our whole lives revere you. Lord, thank you for the countless blessings that you've bestowed on us. And in your son's name we pray. Amen. The scripture reading this morning will come from Mark chapter 1, verses 30 or 28 through 34. Mark chapter 1, verses 28 through 34. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife, mother, lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. If you want to turn your marketing books, it's on invitation. It's number 337. It's number 337. You would at this point stand, we'll sing it's number 237. So 237. Deeper than the ocean. And wider than the sea is the grace of our Savior for sinners like me. Sin from the Father, and it fills my soul just to feel and to know. That his blood makes me whole. His grace reaches me. Yes, his grace reaches me. And for that to return a thing. Now I'm under his control, and I'm happy in my soul, just to know that his grace reaches me. Higher 
and the mountains and cried the earth and the sun. It was offered at Calvary for everyone. Greatest of treasures and its mine to dig, though my sins were as scarlet, he has washed them away. His grace reaches me, yes, his grace reaches me, and will last to eternity. Now I'm under his control, and I'm happy in my soul, just to know that his grace reaches me. We are in the midst of a weekend of coming and going, as is usually the case when we get an extra day on the weekend. As we look around and see the vacant spots, we think of people who are visiting family and away for other reasons. We want to pray for their safety, and we look forward to having them back. But we also have, filling up a few of those places, some visitors with us today, Maybe because it's a four-day weekend, maybe not, but we're glad that you're here. We always appreciate our visitors. We want you to be comfortable. We want you to be blessed by our worship today, and we want to get to know you. So we wear these name tags. We, we hope you will, and we look forward to greeting you after services as well today. We have a couple of new sisters in Christ with us today. You read the bulletin, you learned that Mercy Tia was baptized on Wednesday evening after services. If you were not here to give her a hug then, you want to be sure and do that today and congratulate Mercy on her decision. We also have another new sister in Christ, which not everybody may know about unless you read your email on the last day or so. And on uh, During our last... Well, not our last, but one of our door-knocking efforts on Sunday afternoon, Scott Adams and Tracy Sarver knocked on the door, and he met Mary Wise and Callie Wise and proceeded to have a Bible study with him. He and Allison went over there. I believe it was Thursday night and had a study. He and Miss Catherine went over there Friday morning and studied the Bible some more with them. And Mary and Callie were baptized into Christ here on Friday afternoon. And we are thrilled. We rejoice with them. And Mary is able to be with us here today. She's sitting with Allison. And be sure and give her a big hug and congratulate and welcome her at the close of our services today. As we study God's Word today, I want you to go with me to a little place called Capernaum. We're talking about she arose and served them, but that's only part of the story. These are the three places I had as our main scripture, Mark, to be read for us, Mark chapter 1. But I'm going to be reading today especially from Luke chapter 4 and the verses there, because all three of these passages, as so often the case in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they tell the story in a little bit of extra detail and some that may not be contained in others about what happened as Jesus interacted with people in this case. If we go back to Capernaum, we go back to a rather small town. A small, and by most people's estimations at the time of Jesus, and even since then, a rather insignificant town. You notice it's to the northern part of what we think of as Israel, the Holy Land, the place, Palestine, the place where Jesus walked and taught and uh, had his, his ministry here while upon earth. It's at the northern extreme of that. I have it blown up a little bit here on uh, one side. And we see that Capernaum, the red, the red city here, is right beside the Sea of Galilee. We'll look at a picture in a moment to emphasize that even more. It was an area that Jesus spent a great deal of time in. 
In fact, if you recall, he went to his hometown of Nazareth, not too far away there, but they weren't very accepting of him. He was still the carpenter's son. They had trouble accepting him. But in Capernaum, he taught a number of times, and he taught on at least a couple of Sabbaths, and perhaps many Sabbaths, he taught in the synagogue. And that's where our story today is going to begin, in the town of Capernaum and the synagogue. I want us to notice three words today from our text. It's not a very long text, but I want us to notice three words that I hope will help us to remember what took place there. And remember what's in that passage for us, because we're not simply studying an historic event. We're studying the interaction of Jesus with people that teaches us something. That's what it's written for. Paul said the Old Testament was written for our learning, and certainly the things that Paul wrote and taught and all the other gospel writers in the New Testament, that's there for our learning as well. The first word that I want you to think about me with is the word invitation. Let's focus our, our thoughts on invitation. And I want us to suggest that it's important to invite Jesus into your home. That's something that happened in the story that we're going to look at here in Luke chapter 4. As Jesus leaves the temple, the synagogue rather, leaves the synagogue in Capernaum, Luke says he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. That's Simon Peter, Peter his apostle. Peter about whom so much is written uh, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and also who wrote uh, the names that have his, uh, the books that have his name attached to them in the New Testament. He went from the there to Peter's house. Now the synagogue, if you go to Israel today and you go on a tour, a guide will take you to a location and he will show you the ruins of a synagogue. Now on top, as suggested by the white stones there, you can't read the sign, it says this, this is what's from a 4th century synagogue that was believed to be built on the same site as the synagogue in which Jesus and Peter and the others who were with them were in there in Luke chapter 4 and Mark chapter 1. And in fact, where the white stones end and the darker stones begin, the darker stones are believed to be the actual foundation of that synagogue of Capernaum. And it probably was, being a small town. This may have been the only synagogue that was in this city because it required ten Jewish families, ten Jewish men to be part of a synagogue, and then they would build one. This may have been the only synagogue in Capernaum. Anyway, this is probably the location because it seems throughout history it, a lot of care has been taken because people thought this was a very special site and so it's been preserved the knowledge had been passed along. So this may well have been the site of the synagogue which Jesus and Peter left from as our story begins. It was not far from his house if the site of the house is correctly known. This is an aerial view. Uh, that same wall, that same synagogue that we looked at the wall of a moment ago. And it was located not very far from Peter's house, if that site has been accurately preserved also by historians and archaeologists. Of course, we have only what archaeologists have restored, what they've dug up and put back in place there. Uh, of the original city of Capernaum and where Peter's house might have been. You say, what's that funny looking thing like a spaceship on top of that? That is a Franciscan church building that was built in 1990 and it has a glass floor. So on this site where Peter's house was, the events that we're talking about, you can look down and you can see the ruins when you go there to tour this area. And from another aerial photograph, we see that over here is the site of the synagogue, we believe. Over here is the church building built on top of the ruins of Peter's house. And we're just talking about maybe a couple of hundred feet. We're talking about close proximity between the synagogue where Jesus had been teaching on the Sabbath and the house of Peter to which he went into, a house in which he was invited into. And that's important to us in our study today. It was not uncommon for Jesus to go into people's houses. We could spend a whole lesson and probably more just talking about that. In Matthew chapter 9, he went to Matthew's house. He had called him from the very act of being a tax collector. 
which is what Matthew was doing when he was called to be an apostle. And they were in his house. And he drew criticism because people came and asked his apostles, what's your, what's your teacher doing hanging around with tax collectors? And, of course, they would learn later on why he was there. Luke chapter 10, he was with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He was there multiple times and probably many times, more than what's given to us in Scripture. That seemed to be a place where he had very close friends. In Luke chapter 19, you remember he said to Zacchaeus, You come down, for I'm going to your house today. He was in Zacchaeus' house. And in John chapter 2, he was in someone's house for a wedding feast. Jesus spent a lot of time with people, and he spent time in their homes. And so we focus today on the fact that Jesus was invited by Peter, perhaps informally, and perhaps he'd been there before, but G Peter invited him to come to his house. Now, what we want to think about is how important it is to invite Jesus into our homes. Is it possible to leave Jesus at the church building? Think with me about that. Is it possible to have a view of worship on Sunday as a little segment of your life that's over here, and then when you go through the door and you get in your car and you go back home, you have the rest of your life over here? Is it possible to leave Jesus at the church building? Just like Peter could have left Jesus at the, at the synagogue, but he didn't. And because of that, a great miracle took place. His mother-in-law is going to be healed. We'll read about that in a moment. But is it possible for us, because the world keeps us so busy and so focused and sometimes perhaps so selfish about other things, that we leave Jesus at the church building? And I don't have to answer that question for you. You know it's possible, don't you? It's very possible for that to happen and for us to forget to take Jesus with us, to invite him into our homes. What would be the difference if Jesus were there in our homes? Let's think in a, figure, in, in a literal sense now, not just figuratively. Let's say Jesus is in your home. He's right there. And the things that go on day in and day out, Jesus is watching. And you and your spouse are having an argument about something, a disagreement, and it begins to get a little bit intense, it begins to get a little bit heated, and you're just about to say something that if you thought about it beforehand, you know you shouldn't say because it's going to be real hard to take back and it's going to hurt, and you think, wait a minute, there's Jesus over there, he's watching, and you bite your tongue and you don't say it. You look over at Jesus, Jesus smiling and nodding. Good job. That's what I want you to do. Or you, you go to your closet and you pick up something in the closet, you bring it out there, and you look at it and you say, you know, that, that probably shows a little more skin that I need to be seen in public. I probably don't need to wear that. And Jesus is over there, you look at him, and he's saying, no, probably don't. Or you're sitting at the kitchen table and you're making out your contribution check. For the time we worship together, we worship God by our contribution, our giving. You're getting ready to write a figure there in, in that place where you write down the numbers. And then you realize that there's Jesus looking right over your shoulder. <coughs> and you think about it some more and you, you change that figure. Or you're sitting on the couch and you've got the remote in your hand. Of course, that's what we all said, isn't it? We're sitting there with a robot in our hand, looking at the television show, and we're flipping around, and we stop at a show. Boy, there's some racy stuff. Some racy stuff that maybe just for a second appeals to us. And we forget what we're doing. We set the, we set the remote down, and we start getting involved in that. And then we look up, and there's Jesus over in the side of the room. And he's got a tear coming down the side of his cheek. What if Jesus was invited to your home? What if Jesus was in your home? What if Jesus knew what you were doing? What if you gave him that invitation to be there in your lives? You say, well, that's far-fetched. Jesus isn't really in our homes. But I say to you this morning, number one, 
you can invite Jesus into your home. That's your choice, just like it was Peter's. Number two, Jesus does know everything that you're doing. He doesn't have to be there standing in the room to know it. And he knows what you and your spouse are saying to each other, and he knows what kind of clothes you're wearing, he knows what kind of TV you're watching, and he knows what you're writing on the contribution check, and he knows everything else about you, whether you've invited him or not. And it is an indic indication of our desire to invite him into our home if we decide to make our decisions based on the fact that Jesus is in this home. I've invited Jesus to be in this home, to stay in this home, and I'm going to make decisions accordingly. I'm going to remind myself that Jesus knows, and therefore I'm going to do what he's asked me to do. So the first word this morning from our text is invitation. Invite Jesus to come into your home, just like Peter invited Jesus to come into his home. It was a great miracle. But our second word is the word conversation. Conversation. You have your outline there. That's number two. Conversation. Tell Jesus about your needs. Isn't it foolish to have somebody available to do something, knows how to do it, and you don't bother to tell them that you need them to do it? Imagine someone that was in your house that had the ability to give you advice about something that needed fixing in that house and you know that, but they didn't know you needed it, that advice, and you remain silent. You wouldn't do that. You'd tell them about your needs. you say, you know, I know you know something about this. Can, can you tell me what I need to do? And they give you that advice. Can you ha imagine having the creator of the universe in your house and not telling him what you need? Can you imagine having the one who knows how to take care of every need that you have and who knows what's best for you because he knows the past, the present, and the future without end, can you imagine not asking him for help with those needs? That's what happened here in Peter's house. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever, and they made a request of him, that's Jesus, concerning her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. Miracle goes over, over pretty quick. Jesus performed lots of miracles, but notice what happened along with this. They told Jesus what their needs were. Who did? Well, Peter, perhaps. Perhaps Peter's wife, because this, this was his, her, her mother now. Perhaps other family members were present. At any rate, they came to Jesus and they besought him. They entreated him. In a sense, it's like begging. They pleaded, would please heal this woman here. She's sick. What did she have? She had a high fever. The word fever means on fire. The word high is where we get our word mega. It's literally a transliteration from the Greek. Mega. Come on down. We're having a mega sale today. You're going to get lots of bargains. We're having a mega sale. We use that word all the time with descriptions in our, in our world, don't we? She had a mega fever. She was really sick. And they besought that Jesus would do something about that because by this time they already knew that he was special and that he had power over things. Back, back while they were in the temple, back during that teaching on the Sabbath in the temple, he had healed a man who was possessed by a demon. They knew Jesus had this power. And so they talked to Jesus. They had a conversation with Jesus. They talked to him about their needs and said, please help this woman to be better. And he did. He healed her on the spot, and he healed her instantly. Throughout Scripture, we have illustrations and we have direct instructions to tell Jesus what we need, to have a conversation with him. We call that prayer. To tell him what we urgently, urgently need. This is they did there for Simon's mother-in-law. Daniel chapter 3, we won't take time to read the story, but it's one that you may be familiar with. Nebuchadnezzar makes this 90-foot tall golden statue. 
must have been something to see. He puts it out there where everybody can see it, everybody can bow down to it when the time comes. And he said, the time's going to come when you hear the instruments of music and you hear them playing, you bow down to that statue because I say so. And if not, there's a fiery furnace waiting for you. That was his command. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three young Jewish men who were faithful to God, knew they couldn't do that. And they didn't. And people who were probably, the text doesn't say that, but probably a little jealous of them anyway, ran to Nebuchadnezzar and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those Jew boys, they don't bow down to your statue. And he calls them before him. And there seems to be a, a pretty good uh, relationship between him and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the first place. He, he wanted to give them a second chance. You know, it's like, maybe he didn't, didn't understand, guys. Let me explain this to you now, and I know it'll be okay if we just come to an understanding. He told them what they needed to do. You need to, when the music's played, bow down. You're going to do that? And they said, we can't do it. And in fact, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said that we do not need to be careful to answer you. Literally, we do not have cares or needs to give you an answer for what we're doing. We answer to Jehovah. Jehovah has forbidden the worship of idols. We don't have a care that tells us we've got to explain ourselves to you. We're sorry. It wasn't a smart aleck answer. It was the truth. It was simply saying to Nebuchadnezzar, who thought he was some sort of deity, saying, no, it's not you we worship. It's not your statues we worship. It's Jehovah God. So we don't have a care about this. We're not, we're not worried about this. It's not something we've got to take care of. We don't have to explain ourselves. They didn't put that care on themselves, even though the fiery furnace was right there. And remember, they didn't know what came at the end of the chapter. They didn't know the rest of the story. But they were able to say, you know, our God is able to save us, but if he doesn't, we still don't have a care about this matter. Your cares. That's what you have a conversation with Jesus about. You have the things that are burdens for you, and you take them to him. Psalm 55 and verse 22, the psalmist says, Cast your care upon the Lord. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And that word casting is used for, for getting rid of burdens, releasing burdens so you don't have them anymore. Now, all of us have probably done this at some time in our lives, maybe recently. You picked up some kind of load that had to be transported to another place. And you looked at it and said, oh, I can handle that. <laughs> I can handle that. I can do it. I'm strong enough. And you picked it up in the middle. You said, I better get where I'm going quickly. <laughs> I better get over there. And you start making your way to where you're going. And, and your hands get weak and, you're, and you're, your, your arms start to tremble. And your legs are just barely moving. And you think, I've got to get there quickly. I can't hold this much longer. And then you get to the table and you, you throw it down. Whew, I just made it. I couldn't have held that much longer. That's casting. That's throwing your burden somewhere else. In that case, on the table. Peter says, what you're trying to do, handling your cares without Jesus, handling your burdens without Jesus, you're trying to carry all those things yourself. Don't do that. Take those and cast them on Jesus because it's nothing to him. That weight is not a, a problem to him. So cast all your cares upon him. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 8, Paul says something very similar. And he begins by saying, be careful in nothing. Don't have anxiety. Don't have burdens. Don't have worries. Don't have cares like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not have even facing a fiery furnace. That's not a care to us. We're not going to worry about that so much as to say we've got to make an explanation to you, Nebuchadnezzar. We have given our cares over to Jehovah, and we're okay. And then Matthew 11 and verse 28 is a little bit different wording, but it gets us to the same place. What did Jesus say? He said, Come unto me, all you who are, who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give, your, give you rest. Cast your burdens upon me. Cast your burdens upon me. That was the invitation that Jesus gives. 
So when we invite Jesus into our house, we give him the invitation, we certainly want to give him the conversation and say, Jesus, here are the needs that I have. I'm heavy laden. I've got some problems, and I know I can't handle them, but I know you can. And I'm going to turn those over to you. We had an invitation. We had a conversation. But then finally, before the text is over with, we have appreciation. You invite Jesus into your home. Say, Lord, I, I want you with me all the time. You tell him what your needs are. And then you appreciate him. In appreciation, you show Jesus your gratitude. And that's what this woman did who was healed. Peter's mother-in-law. We don't know her name. Just Peter's mother-in-law. But she was healed and immediately she arose and served them. She was 100%. Well, that's the miracles of Jesus, isn't it? That's why Jesus healed people. None of this stuff like you, you come back in a week, you come back in two weeks, and progressively you'll get a little bit stronger. You think your way out of this, or it, it heals itself naturally. Jesus said to that fever, I rebuke you, and it was gone. And she jumped up, and she didn't wait to recuperate. She served them. And we can picture her running all over the house like these godly women do, taking care of meals and and dishes and details. That's what that's what seemed to happen. And in fact, this word serve, Drew talked about it in class this morning. It's that same word that we talk about for minister, for deacon, for doing things like that. It's that same word. You know where it comes from? It literally means, it comes from two words, which means to stir up the dust. Now, I, I don't think they dusted like we do today back then. I, I don't think that was typical in Jewish households. So to say that she stirred up the dust probably was a figurative way of saying her feet were moving so quickly around that house that she just left a dust trail because she was serving them with enthusiasm. She appreciated what Jesus had done for her and she showed that appreciation by serving and that's what we're all supposed to do. Show Jesus that we appreciate Him. How do we do that? We could spend a lot of time talking about that. One way, of course, is to give a cup of cold water. Matthew 10, verse 42. Jesus said, Whoever gives a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, you do it because you belong to me, you do it because you appreciate what I've done for you, and you give a cup of cold water to this little one, you shall in no wise lose your reward. That's what Jesus said. Then in Matthew chapter 25, we see him standing there before the righteous on his right hand, and he says, You saw me when I was hungry, when I was thirsty, when I was a stranger. You saw me when I was naked. You saw me when I was sick. You saw me when I was in prison. And every time you took care of my needs, you appreciated me. They said, How do we do that? You did it to other people. That's how we show appreciation for Jesus. He's not here to wait on. He's not here for us to wash his feet any more than he's literally here in that house watching us as we live day by day because we've invited him. He's not literally here, but we can help other people. And Jesus says, when you do that, when you serve them, you serve me. But there's another way to show our appreciation. And this, I would suggest, is, is even a superior way to the first. And we ought to do the first. But we certainly ought to be doing the second. John 1, verses 41 and 42. Andrew meets Jesus. And through the conversation that takes place, Andrew is convinced of his identity. And the first thing that he does is run to Simon Peter and say, come and see him because we have found the Messiah. And that word Messiah meant a whole lot more to Peter in that context back then than it probably does us today when we read that sentence. We found the Messiah. We found the anointed one. We found the one that we've been looking forward to for generations. Come and see him. Andrew took Simon Peter to Jesus and then Andrew wound up not having a lot more read of, but it's written about him in the New Testament, whereas Peter had a great deal written about him. But Andrew went and got him. He told other people about the Messiah. John chapter 4, you remember the woman at the well, that conversation Jesus had with her. She runs back into the city and she says, come and see. 
come and see this man. He's a man that told me everything there is to know about me. Could this be the Messiah? She introduced other people to Jesus. How is your appreciation for Jesus? We introduced other people to him. Luke chapter 8 and verse 39. The setting is the what we sometimes call the Gadarene demoniac. Gadarene was an area somewhere around south and east of, of that Sea of Galilee we looked at a while ago, kind of catty cornered over where Capernaum was on the other shore. It was a region there, and Jesus went there, and uh, there was a man who lived in the graveyard, didn't wear any clothes, they couldn't keep chains on him because he broke them, broke them, and he cried and whined and looked pitiful all day and all night. Nobody could do anything about him. And Jesus went and healed him just like that. Took the demons and took them out of him and and he was fine, he was right in mind, he was clothed, he was talking like a, a normal person does. He said, Lord, I want to follow you. Let me get in the boat with you. Wherever you go, I want to go. Jesus said, no, no. You go back home and you tell other people how much God has done for you. Well, I suspect he still wanted to go with Jesus, but you know what he did? He went back and Luke says, and he published what had happened to him. That word publish is caruso, the Karux, the herald. It, it today represents those who speak out and tell people about Jesus. Back then it was a representative of the king who went before and said, the king's coming, the king wants this, the king asked you to do that. That's what the herald of the Karux did. This man was a Karux for Jesus. And he went back and he told everybody. He published it abroad. He told other people about Jesus and what Jesus had done for him. That's how we show appreciation to Jesus. Acts 8 and verse 4. Saul, before the road to Damascus, he was persecuting. He was leading the persecution. And it got so bad that only the apostles were left in Jerusalem. Everybody else was run out for fear of the persecution. And as they went, they went everywhere preaching the word. Who? The preachers? The elders? The deacons? The Bible class teachers? No. Every Christian who left Jerusalem, because Saul was going to kill them or imprison them if they didn't, they left in every direction probably, and they went everywhere preaching the word, telling other people about Jesus. That's how they showed the appreciation to Jesus, by doing that. There's a great deal in this little story about Peter's mother-in-law being healed. This morning, let's learn from it. Invite Jesus into your home. And though he will not be there physically, he can be there through your knowledge of his word. From his knowledge that he knows what's going on in your life, he wants you to make good choices, and he'll be there to help you. Invite Jesus into your home, an invitation. Have a conversation with him. Tell Jesus about your needs. He's there to listen for everybody. You, you don't need anybody else to go to Jesus on your behalf. It's, it's great to go to God on other people's behalves, but we can go to God on our own behalf because he died for each one of us. His promises to each one of us. He hears each one of us. Tell Jesus about your needs because he's the one that has the power and the inclination to help you. Have a conversation. And then show your appreciation. Show Jesus your gratitude for what he has done for you by giving a cup of cold water to somebody who's thirsty. By doing all those other things that met needs as Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 25. Most particularly by telling other people what Jesus can do for your soul. What Jesus can do for you spiritually. How Jesus can take someone who is a sinner separated from God and through the power of his sacrifice, his blood, can make them a child of God who are on their way to heaven. And for that, of all things, we should be appreciative. This morning, if you're not a child of God, we want to encourage you to make that decision if, as you know several have already done this week to decide to belong to him every blessing that exists every spiritual blessing that we want we need 
crucial to our, our spiritual existence exist in Jesus Christ. And thankfully, the New Testament is not confusing about how to get into Jesus Christ. It tells us very well. It says you have to believe in Jesus Christ. That's a logical step, isn't it? I've got to believe that this is the Messiah. As Andrew believed and went and told Peter, hey, we found the Messiah. We believe that. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and He died for us. We repent. That is, we look at sin and we say, sin is no longer going to have a grip on me. I'm going to live differently. I'm going to be a different person. I'm going to live for Jesus. And we understand the concept of godly sorrow for that which is sin and that which separates us from God. And we don't want to commit it. And we confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then we contact His blood as we reenact the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Having our sins washed away and then inside Jesus Christ we have all the blessings that He has promised to those who belong to Him. This morning, no better time than now if you've not done that to obey Jesus Christ in this way. But because many of us here are already children of God, we also have to remember that there's a way to come back to Jesus if we stray. And He said that you can ask for forgiveness. You can turn around from what you're doing that is wrong, and you can be forgiven. And you can belong to me once more. My blood will cleanse you day by day, continuously, if you will simply walk in the light. If that's a decision you need to make this morning, we encourage you to make that as well. Asking God for forgiveness. Determined to make the changes in your life that need to be changed. And come to Him. This is what you need to do this morning. We're going to encourage you as we stand and sing. Heart bright with calm. Dost thou count all things for Jesus but false? Is thy heart bright with calm? Is thy heart bright with calm? Washed in the crimson blood, cleansed and made holy, humble and holy. Right in the sight of God. Hast thou dominion or self and or sin? Is thy heart right with God? Over all evil without and within. Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Wash in the crimson blood, cleanse and made holy, humble and holy, right in the sight of God. Are all thy powers unto Jesus controlled? Is thy heart right with God? Does he each moment abide in thy soul? Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Wash in the crimson blood, cleanse and made holy, humble and holy, right in the sight of God. Thank you.